You're listening to AM Now, an Accounting Matters podcast. I'm Adam Olson. And I'm Matt Fisser. While we took off last week here at AM Now, the accounting, reporting, and sustainability landscape did not, meaning we've got a lot to get into, so let's get started. So first things first, we have a round of substantial sustainability reporting updates to touch on this week, starting with one of the biggest headlines coming on the last day of July with the finalization of the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, or ESRS. For those that may still be scratching their heads here, the ESRSs were a derivative of the EU's Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSRD, which requires certain large companies and listed small and medium-sized companies, as well as parent companies of large groups to include in a dedicated section of their management report, the information necessary to understand the entity's impacts on sustainability matters, and the information necessary to understand how sustainability matters affect the company's development, performance, and position. The European Commission was required to adopt the first set of sustainability reporting standards, specifying the information that companies are to report in accordance with that directive. The original drafts of ESRS were completed last November. Following the draft, feedback was collected and considered from numerous European agencies and other stakeholders. As part of that feedback in another recent but brief consultation period this past June, the Commission introduced additional modifications to those draft ESRSs. These included changes to the materiality approach, the phasing in of certain requirements, conversion of certain requirements into voluntary data points, the introduction of flexibilities in a number of disclosure requirements, the introduction of technical modifications to ensure coherence with the EU's legal framework, and enhance interoperability with global standard setting initiatives. Following these modifications, the commissions adopted the final ESRSs at the end of July, just in time for when most Europeans begin their summer holiday season. <laughs> Wanted to get that one done, yeah. I think. Uh, the regulation would enter into force four months after the date of adoption, meaning the regulation and therefore the ESRS would apply from January 1st, 2024 for financial years beginning on or after January 1st, 2024. The regulation would be binding in its entirety and directly applicable in all EU member states. Stay tuned for an upcoming episode on our sister podcast, Accounting Matters, where we plan to further unpack the CSRD's ESRSs in more detail and help explain why U.S. companies aren't off the hook necessarily with these international regulations. We also love our acronyms. We do. (laughs) And speaking of international rulemaking and standard setting, the ISSB weighed in on the finalization of the EU's ESRSs. As you'll recall, the ISSB recently finalized their own sustainability reporting standards at the end of June, IFRS S1 and IFRS S2. Following the release of the finalization of the ESRSs, the ISSB continued to stress the importance of interoperability among all the sustainability reporting frameworks and regulations to help ease transition for impacted reporting entities. The ISSB highlighted that the European Commission, EFRAG, and the ISSB have worked jointly to improve the interoperability of their respective climate-related disclosure requirements and the overlapping climate disclosure standards. They believe this work has resulted in a high degree of alignment between the two standards, which will reduce complexity and duplication of entities needed to apply both the ISSB standards and ESRSs. Yeah, good news there. But they did emphasize that differences will still exist as both the ESRS and ISSB standards were developed within their respective mandates. These differences, for example, the use of double materiality in applying the ESRS and only financial materiality for the ISSB are inherent in those different mandates. To assist entities who will apply both ESRS and ISSB standards, the European Commission, together with EFRAG and the ISSB, plan to develop an interoperability guidance material that would allow reporting entities to work between the two sets of standards and understand where incremental disclosures may be necessary. And staying overseas, while we mm-hmm. talk about the ISSB's new standard, the UK appears to be one of the first jurisdictions to begin to incorporate the ISSB's new sustainability reporting standards as part of their own standard setting process. The UK government highlighted last week that it plans to create its own UK Sustainability Disclosure Standards, SDS, for UK companies to use to report on sustainability and climate-related risks. These new standards will be based on the ISSB recently published sustainability and climate-related reporting standards. 
In its statement, the UK's Department of Business and Trade said that it will base the UK sustainability disclosure standards on the IFRS standards in order to ensure that sustainability disclosures by UK companies are globally comparable and useful for investors, with the UK rules diverting from the global baseline only if absolutely necessary for UK specific matters. Now, the plan to launch the UK standards follows the update earlier this year of the UK's green finance strategy, which included a pledge to assess the new IFRS sustainability and climate related reporting standards once they were published. The department highlighted that the Secretary of State for Business and Trade will consider the endorsement of the IFRS sustainability disclosure standards to create the UK sustainability disclosure standards by next summer. A lot happening on the sustainability front with all these major rules and standard setting processes finally coming to completion. But I know for those of us in the U.S., we're still anxiously awaiting the SEC's final climate related disclosure rule, which, again, is set to be completed at some point this fall. Yeah, and while we wait for that rule to be finalized, the SEC did recently issue another final rule that was a long time coming around cybersecurity disclosures. At the end of July, the Commission adopted rules for registrants to disclose material information over their cybersecurity risk management, strategy, and governance. The SEC said the rules are intended to make sure that registrants disclose material cybersecurity information and provide investors with more consistent, comparable, and decision-useful information. The rules also codified many of the previously issued existing concepts from interpretive guidance on cybersecurity by the SEC and in the Division of Corporation Finance's staff guidance on cybersecurity disclosures. However, these new rules require even more prescriptive disclosures about cybersecurity incidents and risk governance. Specifically, the new rules will require registrants to disclose on item 1.05 of Form AK any cybersecurity incident they determine to be material and to describe the aspects of the nature, scope, and timing of that incident. The registrant will also be required to disclose the incident's material impact or reasonably likely material impact. Item 105, Form 8K, will generally be due four business days after it is determined a cybersecurity risk is material. That's a quick turnaround. And considering that, companies need to think about their current processes that are in place and how they need to put others in place to meet the deadline. These disclosures may be delayed if it is determined from the U.S. Attorney General that immediate disclosures would pose a substantial risk to national security or public safety. The new rules also add Reg SK Item 106, which requires registrants to describe their processes for assessing, identifying, and managing material risks related to cybersecurity. Speaking of governance, Item 106 also requires registrants to include descriptions of the board's oversight of cybersecurity risks and management's role in assessing and managing those material material risks. These disclosures will be required in the 10K, and comparable disclosures are required in 20F and Form 6K for foreign private issuers. Yeah, and those final rules will become effective 30 days after publication in the Federal Register. All registrants other than smaller reporting companies must begin complying with the requirement to report material cybersecurity incidents as defined on Form 8K or Form 6K on the later of 90 days after publication in the Federal Register or what will be December 18th of this year. Smaller reporting companies will have until June 2024 to begin complying with the Form 8K requirements. However, all registrants, including smaller reporting companies, will be required to comply with the annual disclosure requirements beginning with annual reports for fiscal years ending on or after December 15th, 2023, so this year. December is not that far off, so considering how time flies around here, uh, you know, companies are definitely going to have to start preparing to comply with these new disclosure requirements around cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And our last update for the week, we can't leave our friends at the FASB hanging. They also recently updated their project over the disaggregation of certain types of income statement expenses. So on July 31st, the FASB issued their proposed accounting standard update that would apply to all public business entities. To keep this brief, the ASU has detailed disclosures in a tabular format that would be needed over the following categories for each relevant expense line item on the face of the income statement. They include categories such as the inventory and manufacturing expenses, employee compensation, depreciation, intangible asset amortization, and depreciation, depletion, and amortization as part of any oil and gas producing activities. 
Yeah, and those are required for each relevant expense caption. And we love to use unique terms in accounting, but just to define that, a relevant expense caption is an expense presented on the face of the income statement within continuing operations. So those further disaggregation requirements of inventory and manufacturing expenses into those aforementioned costs uh, or categories are what's required there. Additionally, disclosures of qualitative descriptions of amounts remaining in relevant expense captions are required that are not separately disaggregated quantitatively. And finally, disclosing total amount of selling expenses and the entity's definition of selling expenses. If you have any comments, you got to get them in now because they're due right before Halloween on October 30th, 2023. Yeah, definitely weigh in there if you're a public business entity and have some thoughts. But that rounds us out for this week. You know, for a deeper dive into what's trending in accounting and finance, check out our other podcasts on the Accounting Matters feed on your preferred listening platform. Again, I'm Adam Olson. And I'm Matt Fisser. Thanks for listening to AM Now. We'll see you next week.